for this pressure, even in itself being asserted by other groups in whose actual existence socialized principles are also present, although perhaps at the moment disfigured. But the great motion toward the right of the human being, the great motion of the political equity of peoples, the rise in recognition of the right of all men to their place in the sun, their opportunity to, uh, to direct or to share in the administration of their own destinies. This tremendous concept of workable political democracy under many names, but giving to the people liberties and equalities unknown in ancient times, is also a tremendous ethical step forward. We know that the Pharos of Alexandria under Saturn, the symbol of the old one, mathematics, the Eiffel Tower of printing, we have all these different levels, and then we have this concept of Saturn, concept of the aged, coming forward to us in another great development that has come to us in many cases in the memory of the living, and that is the rise of the whole pattern of the security of man in his advancing years. Old age security of various kinds, endowments, insurance, and even national intervention, the gradual development of a protective economics for the old, a gradual recognition of the right of the individual to the dignities of existence, a right ignored by most of antiquity. This gradual protective mechanism, with its faults, with its mistakes, but with its great hope behind it, has emerged and is fighting its way toward gradual integration and rationalization. We have the advantage over what was the absence of our present attainment. We have yet far to go, but the gradual development of securities, security for the young, security for the unemployed, security for the aged, these things are here and they are here to stay, and they are here to grow and to develop. And they represent a tremendous thing, which in terms of the ordinary probabilities of, of life uh, is what, little less than a wonder, something that is almost inconceivable in the light of ancient ways, but to us is becoming familiar and generally acceptable. Then we have under Mars. Various developments, symbols, developments from the ancient mausoleum of Heliconassus, and we then have another concept, the fight through to what we know today as universal education. The power of universal education is something uh, that is to be reckoned with. Uh, not more than a hundred or a hundred and fifty years ago, the majority of human beings were born into this world with a conviction that they must remain illiterate. And while today we still have a great deal of illiteracy, more than we realize, still the struggle toward universal education, the extending of the privileges of education into the most remo remote parts of the world, this struggle goes on, moved and fired and impelled by something within man himself this tremendous dynamic to correct the weaknesses which he is discovering in the social structure around him. He is realizing more and more that his own security as an educated person depends upon the fact that other persons are educated. That we cannot have world peace, we cannot have world health until ignorance in far places is overcome. We are also under tremendous pressures to determine the essential nature of education, to recognize the need for reform and change within the structure of it. But regardless of these changes that must come, and they will come also out of this same pressure within man, we have made an achievement which would have been incredible to antiquity, namely that we have advanced education until it is no longer limited to classes, that it is no longer limited to groups or levels, 
but that a certain amount of education in our Western way of life is now compulsory, and that the individual is destined and inevitably foreordained to have a knowledge as his common birthright, which would have been the admiration of his ancestors. Actually, in the Middle Ages, kings could not write, princes could not read, and the average person had no knowledge of even the simplest mathematical formulas. He could not even add or use the multiplication table. Thus it is important uh, to realize that in a short time this has been transformed, not in the terms of 10,000 years, but in the terms of 500 years. Man has greatly and wonderfully advanced his abilities and created a concept in himself which he must live up to, and it is this group of concepts with which we are primarily concerned at, uh, concerned at this moment. Under Venus, the hanging gardens of Babylon and the wonderful reservoirs for the watering of these gardens, comes something else. And that is the complete structure that we have today of public utilities and sanitation. Here again is something we have never known before in the history of the world. The lack of these facilities prevented the ancient world from developing cities, and it was not until Vitruvius created the aqueducts in Rome and designed the sewers that Rome could even begin to be a city. We also realized that as late as the 15th century, the average city of Europe had no sewers, that in the 17th and 18th century, London had no public sanitation, and up to very recently, of course, with the development of our principles of scientific knowledge, only very recently have public utilities uh, come into existence even as a concept. But these things have advanced our way of life in numerous regards. We are no longer decimated by the bubonic plague. We are not like Europe in the 13th century where 25 million died together in a few months nor we rule Europe between the 13th and the 16th century, where in 300 years, two-thirds of European civilization died of plague. We have gradually cleared many of these problems, and the entire concept of bringing to man a knowledge involving the entire care of himself, a greater increasing scientific awareness of nutrition, of clothing, of sanitation, of hygiene, of eugenics. All of these things have come to man as a birthright in our day, but they are things totally unknown to man of long ago. A few, perhaps, brilliant individuals discovered for themselves. An occasional person may have come under strong influence and become informed, but the body of, the, of society was without these advantages without this knowledge, and therefore subject to numerous infirmities that we do not know. Let us not forget also, of course, that we are subject to infirmities they did not know. But the great picture, the concept of man's development of his public utilities and sanitation principles represents, this concept represents a great step forward, a step forward which will mature and ripen in due course with many other activities. And under Mercury comes the, the seventh of these principles which we wish to bring to your attention. And this is something which is a highly controversial subject, but which in time must mature itself for our very serious consideration. And that is that in the modern world, under Mercury, we have produced the organization of labor. The organization of labor is far more important than we realize. For until man was able to socialize and integrate his working concepts, his entire cultural life had to be sacrificed to the interminable processes of work and activity. The organization of labor is something that could never have occurred before. It has become the foundation of bringing leisure, bringing protection and security to three quarters of the people of democratic civilizations and political systems. 
It has made possible the gradual enlightenment and improvement of labor. It has brought labor into a recognition of leisure. It is gradually challenging labor to personal, individual self-improvement. The problem is still in a comparatively imperfect degree of development. But the power to organize, to protect the power of the individual, his earning capacities, his privileges as a human being, this power unknown to ancient man is perhaps somewhat overworked by modern man. We have gone to extremes, we have become too political, too this and too that, but the great principle of the right of the individual not to be exploited, the right of the individual to profit and share in the consequences of his own endeavors. These principles are right, and in time these principles will find their right workings in our way of life. So here are seven great achievements which we have made, achievements which have to do with the motions of time. These achievements apparently are very close as archetypal structures to the first glorification of the gods in the wonders of the ancient world. Each of these levels represents man thinking from a basic archetype, unfolding that archetype according to the skill and ability of his own consciousness and according to the opportunities and privileges of the times in which he has lived. But each individual going through life is bound into this archetypal concept. Each person has a dominant within his own nature. Perhaps he is potentially the mathematician, perhaps the artist, perhaps the musician. But we are all living on these rays that ride, that uh, ray out from this tremendous corona of the sun principle. Thus each person's contribution is determined by his own focus of attainments. This contribution principle lurks within him and presses him on. If he resists it, denies it, or is unable to recognize it of his own accord, archetypal symbolism usually moves in upon him. He dreams, he has experiences, he feels pressures, he is dissatisfied, he is not in the right place, he is not doing the things he wants to do or was intended to do. And when these symbolic pressures break through him, they break through in symbols that go back to antiquity. They break through in the primordial forms of religion and philosophy. Therefore, the understanding of these forms will help him to imply or to apply and extend these symbols into their utilities, into their practical uses in his modern way of life. So each one of us is in a way a builder of wonders. Each one of us perhaps is attracted to one group of wonders, perhaps is attracted to one of the divisions of the ethical achievements of mankind. Perhaps we are not sympathetic with all of them. Perhaps we feel that some of them are not what they should be. We are drawn to one and find it impossible to understand another. Yet actually within our natures we are likewise seeking equilibrium. And one of the reasons for tension and stress in human life is this inability to commonly appreciate the good in all things. While one thing seems good and another bad to us, while we can accept certain ideas but must reject others, there is stress and tension within our own natures. We are therefore searching for this solar principle representing, represented by leagues and assemblies and organizations by which all incompatibilities within our own consciousness can likewise be reconciled. Each individual in his own personality is searching for a league of nations, is seeking a league which will bind his notions together to form out of them a solid and unified ability to create and express. All divisions in society reflect divisions within man himself. And it is the useful and proper labor of each individual to bring together the seven powers of his own soul, represented for the seven monuments, to build these powers into a program of practical and purposeful endeavor. 
using these powers to improve the society around.